May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. We pray it in the name of your son, Jesus, who is our savior, the one who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And may the people of God say, Amen. I have a friend who, uh, who is, as we say, too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. Have any, do any of you have a friend like that? You don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to, but I, I have that friend. It's not Lewis. I promise it's not Lewis. Um, I love this friend to death, and um, he has deepened my spiritual life so much over the years. It's just incredible. He continues to be a, a real gift in my life. But let me just tell you, don't call him in a crisis, okay? Don't call him. This is how it will go if you call him in a crisis. Hey, hey, it's me. I've got this thing going on, a problem, a serious problem. I need some help. I don't know what to do. I don't want anybody to know. I don't want to know what to do, so I need you to tell me what to do. Help me know what I ought to do. I need some help right now. A long pause on the other end of the telephone. Well, he says, well, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. It'll all work out. I'm doing that. I'm doing that. But so far, no good. It ain't helping right now. <laughs> I need some help. Tell me what to do. Well, he says, well, maybe you ought to meditate a while on Psalm 86 or Psalm 90 or, or 121 or 139 or Psalm 16. Any of those would be good. You know, the scripture says, you know, think about anything that's good and pure and holy. Think on these things. Maybe you need to meditate a little bit on a psalm. Oh, my goodness, I know all those psalms, I know them well, but they don't have anything to do with what I am telling you. They don't have anything to do with this problem. Well, he says, well, let me invite you to a season of prayer and fasting. Oh, my goodness, I've been praying, and I fasted once a few years ago. I can't do that anymore. I don't have time for a season. I need to know right now. Right now, I am locked in the bathroom, secretly talking to you on the telephone, so nobody will find out that I don't know what to do. Please tell me something to do. I should have called my friend TJ. He always knows what to do right now. He's good with the right now. It's not always right, but it's now. It's now. And that's what I need is right now. I need some help right now. Too heavenly minded to be any earthly good, or so it seems. Anyway, especially in moments like those. That's why we love those parables of Jesus, isn't it? Especially parables like the Good Samaritan. You remember the Good Samaritan? We know what to do, don't we? If we run across a fella who's been robbed and beaten and left for dead in a ditch, we know exactly what to do, don't we? We don't have to pray. We don't have to think. We know what to do. We know exactly what to do. Even if he's not like us, we know what to do. We go to him. We put some bandages on. We put him in our car and take him to get some help. We pay for it. We know exactly what to do. That, that parable from last week, the sheep and the goats. You remember that? We like the sheep and the goats so much because we know what to do. Feed the hungry. Clothe the naked. Give drink to the thirsty. Welcome the stranger. Visit those in prison. Care for the sick. We know exactly what to do. There is... Such a wonderful concreteness to so much of the teaching of Jesus. That's why we love it. That's why we want to hear it all the time. Because that's what we need, isn't it? Even though we are indeed citizens of heaven, we live here in a very, a very worldly world. It's messy. It's tough full of difficulties and challenges and pain and problems. In what Paul writes to us today, that's what we hear. It's real. It has flesh and blood on it. It meets us where we are day in and day out with some good practical teaching. 
That's what we need, isn't it? Let's, let's hear those words. Colossians chapter 3. Paul's letter to the Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 through 17. Let us hear the word of God. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory Put to death, put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life, but now but now you must get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourselves with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, Barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free, but Christ is all and in all. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body, and be thankful, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. One of the greatest quandaries in life is what we do with our imperfectness, isn't it? Our imperfectness. There comes a time in life when we realize that the folks we thought were so good, so perfect, so great, why, they, they have some pretty deep flaws, don't they? Our heroes have feet of clay. It's a tough realization. Sometimes on the other side of the coin, the folks everybody said were rotten, horrible, terrible people. Why, they rise up and do some really incredibly good things, don't they? And we have to make sense of that, even when it just doesn't fit together like we think it should. The longer we watch people, the longer we listen to what they say and how it matches with how they live, the more we realize just how complicated and broken we all are. It's easy to get cynical, isn't it? To greet everyone we meet with a healthy dose of mistrust and suspicion. We sometimes just can't help it. It's not good for us to be that way but sometimes it's the only means of defense that we have in this life isn't it it makes me think of that old adage that we all know know so well fool me once shame on you fool me twice shame on me fool me once shame on you fool me twice shame on me it's true isn't it 
We know what that means. We know how to live with that. The truth is, for me, my, my own cynicism, it comes just as much from looking in the mirror as it does from being frustrated by the actions of others. We know what old Paul meant when he wrote that word, you know, the word that he wrote, uh, oh, the good that I would, that's not what I do, but the evil that I would not, that is what I do, oh, wretched man that I am. We understand why Paul wrote that. Sometimes I want to put that on my bathroom mirror, just write it there so I can feel better somehow. We wonder why it all has to work that way. Shouldn't, shouldn't we be totally fixed by Jesus now? Shouldn't that be how this thing works out? That's what we think we, we're getting. Doesn't, when, when we put our faith in Jesus and we have our, our hearts filled with the love of God, shouldn't we get it right? Shouldn't everything be made whole? Shouldn't we be in that moment set free from sin and brokenness? That's what the scripture says. That's what the scripture says. Shouldn't that be what we get? That is what we get. And yet that's not what I see when I look in the mirror. It may not be what you see when you look in the mirror either. It just isn't that simple, is it? This life of discipleship, it's a journey. It's a process. It is a trip that we make, isn't it? It doesn't just happen all at, at once. That's why Paul is having to remind us, we who should know better already, Paul is still having to remind us to put to death that which is in you that is earthly. He says, put it to death. Put that stuff to death. He's calling us to get rid of all of this idolatry that is still in our lives. We still are struggling with idolatry. We just can't get rid of it. He says, you've got to get rid of all of this anger and this malice and this wrath and slander and this abusive language that comes from your mouth. You've got to get rid of that. Paul is telling us to put it all to death. He raises these red flags all around us. He says, if you see, if you see any of these behaviors in your life, anger, wrath, malice, slander, fornication, impurity, lust, passion, greed, evil, desire, if you see any of this stuff, it means there is still work to be done. He says, if you have put some thing or someone or some idea or even yourself in God's place in your heart, beware, beware. That is not the life that God imagines for you. That is not what God has. Even though we all do it, we've all done it, what matters most is how quickly can we get back on track? How quickly can we get back on track? That's why Paul writes of this constant renewal, this daily dying to sin and being raised to new life, new life that God gives us in Jesus and through the Holy Spirit. That is why, that's why he writes to the children of God as God's chosen ones. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Wait just a minute. Didn't he just call us greedy, idolatrous fornicators? Did he not just do that? He just called us greedy, idolatrous fornicators. And now he says, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. <laughs> Can we be both? Yes. Yes, we are. By God's grace, we are still God's chosen ones, holy and beloved Clothe yourselves, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience. Bear with one another, forgive each other, and put on love. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts and be thankful. Be thankful. Oh, it's beautiful, isn't it? It's just so beautiful. But it's tough. It's tough work, isn't it? Discipleship is 
hard work. It ranges from choosing to put on the clothes of love. We have to choose some days to put on the clothes of love, don't we? It ranges from that to letting God work within us through the Holy Spirit to listening to God's voice as we run, a, run astray and have to be brought back on course. God is not just working on us. God is working with us. And we must cooperate. There is a great responsibility there, a great responsibility which each of us bears. Now, to be clear, I am not talking about works righteousness, and I am not talking about trying to earn God's favor or our place in God's kingdom. I'm talking about our response to the love and grace of God that pours into us through the Holy Spirit. You see, your response is your response. It can't be anybody else's response. It can't be mama's response, grandpa's response. It can't be anybody else's response. It has to be your response. And God doesn't force a response from anybody ever. You must choose. You must choose how you will respond to the grace and love of God that is poured into your hearts. Will you fight it tooth and nail? Or will you ignore it and hope it goes away by lunchtime? Or, or will you cooperate with it, even when it's tough, even when it hurts, even when it draws out of us behavior that some would say is strange, even when it calls us to the side of the unlovable and says, spend your life there, even then we must cooperate to make a disciple to be a disciple is to walk with God. It is to learn to grow, to have our minds, our hearts, our wills shaped by God's love. And it just doesn't happen magically overnight. I wish that it did, <laughs> but it doesn't. We must live daily in a loving relationship with God that is always learning, always growing, always seeking. Paul says, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Set your minds on the things that are above. How do we do that? How do we do that, Paul? Well, he says, well, you bear with one another. You forgive each other. You love each other. You let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. We let the word of Christ dwell within us each day. We teach and admonish each other in all wisdom, we sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God, doing everything in the name of Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. You see, we take responsibility, responsibility for that work which is ours to do, and we help each other claim the power that God has given us to be the faithful children of love. That God knows we can be. I am learning. Mostly through the school of hard knocks. Which is the best way that I learn. <laughs> I am learning that if I don't take time. Throughout each day. To take my eyes off of the mess of worldliness. In which we live. That I won't have anything to offer. To that mess. Other than to make it worse. And I don't want to do that. What does taking that time look like? What does that time look like? Well, it might be trusting, trusting the Lord enough to step back and seek God's perspective on whatever problem is before us. It might be taking the time to meditate on Psalm 86 or 90 or 139 or 121 or 16 or any of those. Think about those things that are good and right and holy think on these things it might mean doing just exactly that it might mean it might mean entering into a season of prayer and fasting even if it's just for 15 minutes because that's about all I can fast at one time it might mean that it might mean a phone call to that heavenly minded sister or brother in Christ who is able 
by God's grace to lift my eyes above the mess so that I can gain God's perspective and respond with hope and love. That old saying is right and true. Another, a different old saying. God meets us wherever we are, doesn't he? God meets us wherever we are, no matter how low, how bad, how sorry, how terrible, how miserable, how humiliated we might be. God meets us wherever we are, but God loves us too much to leave us there. That is some good news. That's hope. That is life. It is perhaps the greatest thing for which we are thankful this Thanksgiving. And we can't keep it to ourselves. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, may the people of God say, Amen.